All right, decentralized autonomous society. Kevin asks, you have spoken previously about the concept of a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization. It is exciting to imagine how the model forces us to rethink the reasons for building organizations hierarchically. Now that we have the ability to draw consensus from a group of peers without the need for trusted third parties, it can truly change the way we think about and structure organizations of all kinds. What is your long-term vision of this concept at a societal scale? How do you foresee our societal governance models becoming more decentralized and autonomous? I am aware that we are very, very far from this world, so I won't be mad if you end up getting it wrong. Uh, thank you so much, Kevin. So, Decentralized autonomous organizations and the ability to have people organize in loose um, short-term or medium-term or even long-term associations, where the rules are clearly understood and defined by some kind of neutral execution of a, of a smart contract um, or uh, a script. Um, certainly, these types of uh, organizations are going to be extremely interesting. I think in most cases we're going to see these being applied for the narrow case of corporate governance, meaning that for-profit, um, short-term endeavors, ad hoc projects, loose coalitions, crowdfunding applications like ICOs that we've seen already, but other types of um, loose associations of investors or uh, small startup type um, organizations can benefit from this kind of decentralized autonomous organization. I think the term decentralized autonomous organization kind of describes the end vision. Um, and the word autonomous really means that it's not uh, being uh, controlled by individuals, but instead it has a set of rules that allow it to operate on its own. So it's not directed by a board of directors or um, a shareholder vote. It is a, it's a loaded set of words, because we don't know exactly how these things are going to play out. And of course, it is a whole spectrum of possible organizational models. You can have things that are very closely held, tightly controlled, um, but still operate through a set of rules, where essentially what you are doing is you are implementing the voting mechanism of a traditional corporation. Um, and the smart contract simply does what uh, an electronic share would do and a shareholder voting system would do um, all the way to very very autonomous rule based systems um, where no one really is in control uh, where the participants get to um, participate in the organization but they don't get to control it or change the rules. How do we take that up and scale it to a level of society? I mean, that's very difficult to see from this perspective, from what we're doing right now, because these technologies are still very immature. We're going to have to see them in small-scale, um, for-profit, corporate environments, associations, and things like that first. Then you might start seeing these um, be used more generally for governance and decision making. You could use them for nonprofit associations, clubs, and things like that. And we could see these new models of organizations emerge um, that, for example, have to do with political causes or charities or um, clubs and things like that. And then eventually, these might migrate to types of governance that have to do with society's function. Um, within a geography. Um, so you might see this type of application for, uh, let's say, a municipality or a town. But it's, it's much harder to do when you're talking about geography, because there are better mechanisms for organizing people in a close geography. And at the same time, the problems we have with governance at scale in large geographies, like uh, supranational federations, um, things like the United States or the European Union, or even things like the United Nations, transnational organizations. The problems there are, are problems of um, trying to do decision making at scale that's removed from the people um, who are affected by that decision making. And you know, there the real challenge is how do you how do you look at representative governance? Um, do we need representatives to vote on our behalf, or can we have a more direct model um, 
the difference between democracy and demarchy, uh, where you either have representatives voting for you, or you vote directly in all of the matters that come um, that, that influence you. So you might be voting twenty times a day. Um, and again, the, these are all interesting models to explore. I think we're very far from them. So um, that doesn't mean the vision isn't valuable. It just means that um, we have no idea how this is going to play out. And um, as more and more capabilities uh, become available, as more people use this technology and learn this technology, they're going to find different ways to explore it and come up with ideas that, frankly, we can't even imagine today. You talk about the, uh, the parasites and uh, just spread the ball along. Life matters is the name that comes to mind with asset management. And I start seeing these parasites uh, almost come lining up. I mean, for example, bat, uh, fidelity. If you call these folks parasites, and I think a lot of folks are kind of like wanting this to come in and be of course. Able to catch and all this stuff. So um, could you speak to these parasites who are kind of um, I don't know, stepping in the market? And how do we deal with that? What does that mean, the market and Bitcoin and all that? That's part of life, right? We built something good. And because we built something good, the sharks are circling, because they're smelling chum. Right? Um, the reason this entire industry has been saturated by sharks is because there's something there of value. And there's a lot of scams, and a lot of bullshit, um, and a lot of other things floating around. But this is recognition that we've built something really interesting, valuable, and different. And they're desperately trying to buy it, to own it, to get a piece of it. But here's the beauty of it. There's a poison pill at the center of cryptocurrencies, and that is its essence is decentralization. So if you're an organization that is trying to take that and turn it into your new parasitic source of revenue, the only way to do that is to decentralize your own power. And you can't do that because you're architecturally, corporately, organizationally allergic to decentralizing power. Your entire presence and form of existence is based on centralizing as much power as possible. You can't swallow this pill. It means giving up control. It's as hard as reinventing a corporation on an open source basis. Very few can actually do it, and they do it by shedding a lot of their profit and reinventing themselves when they have no other choice. And yet, while you're reluctant to swallow this pill, your younger, more nimble competitors who you kept out of this industry for decades through regulation and regulatory capture and lawsuits and unfair competition through Congress people, they could swallow it more easily because they're smaller and nimble. They'll decentralize themselves first, and they're going to attack you from left field. The big banks are going to be really slow to move. The third tier banks, they're going to be give me some of that good old decentralization and let's take it and shove it so far up the ass of JP Morgan Chase that they don't know what just happened. <laughs> <laughs>